I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about CSS animations, CSS sprites, form building, and more. Let's check it out. First up is parallax.js. Now, just as the name implies, it allows you to create parallax effects on a web page. Does it allow you to create single axe effect? No. Get it? Just, 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 Par just parallax. Just a pair of of lax pair parallax effects. <clears throat> so if we go ahead and scroll around with the mouse, you can see that we can actually parallax up and down, as well as left and right. Whoa! Wow! What is going on? This I is don't amazing. Know. Worlds upside down. Best of all, you can actually do this on a mobile device and it will talk to the gyroscope and based on the way that you're tilting the device, it will parallax in that direction. Pretty amazing. If we go ahead and open this super awesome info panel and head over to GitHub, we can scroll down and see that this is using uh, special HTML5 attributes and this is using the data attribute, in this case, they're calling it data depth. You can put whatever you want there. And the depth value defines how far back in space each of your different layers are. So you just create your layers, and then parallax.js sets up the scene and does the rest. It's a little bit more in depth than that, but that's pretty much how it works. You can use it with jQuery as well as Zepto. Pretty cool stuff. That is really neat. So definitely be sure to check that one out. Really, really cool library. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a library called animo.js. This is a JavaScript library that's dependent on jQuery 2, but it does CSS3 animations. Whoa. Yeah, no, it's really awesome. It gives you um, essentially chaining and callbacks so that when an animation has completed, you can just jump straight into the next one letting you make more complicated, longer CSS animations. That's kind of one of the drawbacks right now. You have to do a whole bunch of weird, crazy JavaScript in order to get things to go at a, a certain way. So they have um, some different examples that you can see on here. Um, here is, we'll, we'll do this one, bounce in left, followed by bounce in right. Whoa. Wow, look at that. See Amazing. That? You want to see that again? Whoa. Look at all that bouncing going on. It's I all crazy. I all day. Yeah. So here's another one. Um, where you can put all these things together and make a little magic. Click that there, and then you can see all the different letters are animating at different times. Now, this is the code to do it. You can see there's really not a lot to, to do here. Uh, as I said before, normally when you're doing animations, you have to do a whole bunch of funky JavaScript to see when things complete, but you can just pass a callback in and chain them that way. So, uh, really cool library. Like I said, it's called animo.js. You can find a link to it in the show notes at youtube.com slash gotreehouse, or search for us on iTunes at The Treehouse Show. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is formbuilder.js. Once again, an aptly named piece of JavaScript. Yeah, what does it do? This allows you to build forms, if you can believe that. Wow. Um, so, basically, if you've ever used something like uh, Wufu or Google Web Forms, it's very similar to that. This is a piece of JavaScript that allows you to embed form builders onto your website so that users of your site can build their own forms. So they have a couple of fields over here on the left side. You can go ahead and drop in, say, an address field. And when you drop things in, it will actually allow you to place them amongst the other form elements. And then you can go ahead and edit the fields and apply some of your own labels and attributes here. You can, of course, remove things as well and go back and add more fields. And it's pretty intuitive. It's all drag and drop and really, really easy to use. And of course, you could go ahead and apply your own styling to this as well and make it look like it's a very well integrated part of your website. So very cool stuff. And it's, it's actually pretty easy to use. You just go ahead and drop in the JavaScript and it just has a couple of dependencies that's kind of the only tricky part about it. Um, but very cool stuff once you have it up and running. Oh, very, very nice library. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a library called complete.ly, or completely. This is a library that does auto-completion, kind of like uh, Google Suggest. Um, so here, we've got some examples. We click on see it in action right here. We'll uh, click on a different travel booking. And it says, type where you want to go. I need 
a, and then you can see there are different suggestions right here. Uh, and this is just a, a quick library to do that. There's different clauses that you can use right here. So we'll say the cat is on the roof. So anyway, that's really not that interesting to watch me type things into a computer. But if you do need to use an auto completion or auto suggest library, I recommend checking out completely. It's small, it's self-contained, and it's very, very easy to use. It has the usual options and configuration you would expect from plugins that we feature here on the show. That is completely awesome. Well, next up Nick, is... you complete me. Complete.me. Man, I really hope that's not a bad website. All right, don't go there. Uh, next up is Clipping Magic, which is a really cool tool for basically extracting uh, things out of photos and removing background images. Of course, you can do this with a tool like Photoshop, but Clipping Magic uses a really cool algorithm to go ahead and remove all of that information. So we can go ahead and click on one of these smiling faces down here, or we could go ahead and upload our own image, but I've already gone ahead and done that. I'm going to click on this image here. So once it's loaded up, we can go ahead and use the additive or subtractive brushes here, and we can set the brush size. I'm going to use a rather broad brush. And with the subtractive brush, I'm just going to go ahead and paint away the parts of the image that I don't want to be in the final result. And then with the additive brush, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of paint on the parts that I want to keep. Wow. And that's really good. If it looks like there's a couple areas that are having some problems, I can go ahead and just go in and clean those up. And this was just a really quick demo of this, but uh, if you spend a little bit more time actually using like finer brushes and stuff, you can get a pretty good transparent PNG result and then you can go ahead and download it. Uh, this is a beta product right now, so you don't actually have to pay for it just yet. It's looking like that they will eventually go to a paid model, but it's free right now, so go ahead and check it out. It's actually faster to do this than to do it in Photoshop, in yeah, my opinion. That's really, really neat. Yep. Very impressive technology. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a project called XDomain. This is a little piece of JavaScript that you can use to do cross-origin requests from JavaScript. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really easy. There's just one uh, HTML file that you have to put on the foreign server that is on a different domain than the web server you want from. It's called uh, proxy.html. You put that on the domain that you want to communicate with. And then the library takes care of everything else for you. Uh, you can see it's really, really easy to use. You just drop in the JavaScript on both the um, master domain and then the other domain that you want to contact. And then it is extremely easy. You just do, uh, here's an example with a jQuery get request. And then right there you have access to the data. Uh, now, this is so much easier to do than previous versions of what you would have to do. Cross-origin site requests are very, very tricky to do, um, and this makes it so much easier. So check it out. It's called xDomain. Not really much to say about it. It's easy to use, and it takes away a lot of pain points when doing those cross-site requests. Wow, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I actually had not heard about this until Jason just talked about it, but this would have been useful to me. Um, Actually, last week I was doing a little bit of WebGL stuff, and to load in models, you need to use JSON data, and you actually have to start up a web server on your computer, even though it's all just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, because it's pulling in that information from what appears to be another domain. So, very cool stuff. Yeah. All right, well, next Sorry up... Sorry I didn't tell you about that last week. That's, that's okay, Jason. This is why I always say we should talk more. I, I, I forgive you. And me? as well? Mm -hmm. I, I we'll don't, think about it. We'll figure it out. All right. Next up, speaking of WebGL, is this really cool example that shows, or demo, that shows off WebGL filters. Now, when people think of WebGL, they typically think of 3D graphics, but you can actually use WebGL for 2D graphics as well. And this is very powerful because you can go ahead and apply all of these complicated effects in real time. Now, this is something that you would typically expect to see in something like Photoshop, but here it is right in the browser on a canvas element. And it's actually able to do fairly complex things like these 
these swirls and things that would take Photoshop a little bit of time to process in its software renderer. But it's actually doing these very quickly here because all of this is being processed on the GPU. Of course, WebGL gives you access to the GPU through the browser, so it's able to process all of these effects in real time. I do want to give credit where credit is due. This was made by Evan Wallace using the glfx.js library, which is a totally separate thing from this, uh, but also very cool and worth checking out. It's very cool stuff. And actually, you can go ahead and use this and then uh, download the image when you're all done. So once again, another thing on the web that uh, is a replacement for Photoshop in yeah, some regards. You're just trying to put Adobe out of business on this episode of the show. That's right. Yeah. So next up, we have a project called Sprite Mapper. Now, we've talked about CSS spriting before on the show. That's where you take a bunch of small images and make them one larger image, then manipulate the background position using CSS. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. This saves on requests and makes it an overall faster experience for your users because they only have to download one image as opposed to a whole bunch of different ones. Well, Sprite Mapper is a CSS sprite map generator. Uh, this is just a, a command line tool that you can use. Uh, it's written in Python, and you can give it the path to your CSS file, and it does magic for you. Uh, it will take all of your images and create the CSS sprite for you. Uh, it, you can give it the base URL, the different sprite directories, and what the output image you want to be is, and then it will generate all of the different CSS for you as well as the image. So very, very useful tool. Uh, not much to say about it. Just if you want to make CSS sprites, this is the way to do it. Very cool stuff. Well, I'm at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cypher. If you want more information on anything we talked about, check us out on YouTube for the show notes and more at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us on iTunes at The Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile, business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.